Hello, welcome everyone. My name is Cecilia Maskell, I'm Professor of Mobile Systems at the University of Cambridge. I will now share my screen with my presentation. Um, so um, this talk is about digital biomarkers uh, in a way that we see them through the wearable devices that we, um, we wear every day um, in our daily lives already and the future wearables that can be devised and how we can link um, these devices to health. So um, there are indeed a constellation of wearable devices uh, that sense our behavior um, every day. So one would imagine that um, this problem of uh, mapping, sensing to health has been solved and uh, that uh, there is no research to be done here. The reality is uh, very different. And um, in this talk with three examples, I will just show that we are uh, really just scratching the surface of uh, what is feasible to do and um, that there are uh, lots of unanswered questions still in this uh, domain. Um, so I, I'm, I will list here <clears throat> some of the challenges and through the examples I'm giving in this talk, I will um, try to answer some of them in the specific context of um, some, some domains. Sensor modalities, while we have started exploring uh, and, and introducing uh, a number of sensors in our wearable devices, um, we're still pushing the boundaries um, of what can be done and we put sensors um, and, and trying to, to see how this can be fit in new form factors. For example, earbuds that I'm wearing today, uh, what can we have in there and how reliable the sensing of this technology can be for various um, aspects. Also, um, we have not been very good at sensing continuously and longitudinally. Uh, the fact that these devices can be worn all day uh, could lead to um, unprecedented views uh, of our health uh, from the data coming out of these devices. But this leads to uh, another problem. Uh, it's not just about the ability of collecting this continuous data, it is also about the interpretation of it. I've talked to um, a few clinic clinicians um, in this year so looking at this problem, while well, looking at this problem, and um, their answer sometimes uh, when I say, well, if you had uh, a device attached to your chest or attached to your abdomen, um, that gives you this sort of input, um, or some sensing, um, what can you do with it? And, and, and because they're not used to see this data, it's actually uh, kind of a leap for them too, to uh, figure out what can be done. So this needs to be solved uh, in consultation and in um, together um, to, to be successful. So it's not just about a, a computer science challenge. It's, it's not just about a, a clinical challenge. It's a joint challenge, multidisciplinary challenge. Many of the studies with sensor devices and health have often been done in quite controlled conditions, um, both because we can then uh, observe the data uh, with another possible, in a, another possible way and getting labels for the data. So we know exactly what's happening. We can see if we can map the sensor to the data or because it's actually difficult to um, get data from devices spread around in, in, at scale uh, to people. So there are very few free living um, condition uh, studies. It's also true that um, when we deal with clinical um, and health, um, the, the measures that machine learning has been using, which is accuracy, how accurate is the prediction uh, from this data to this uh, outcome, is not perhaps the best measure or not perhaps the only measure we're interested in. Uh, we want to know how uncertain the prediction accuracy um, is for a specific output. Because we, if we know if um, a model is uncertain, we might find alternative ways. So if it's a, if it's, it might be cheap to go and re-get the sample from the user, re-get the data and um, pass it. Maybe the, the sample was noisy and the model realizes it and it's uncertain about the prediction. Or um, if the collection of the data is expensive, such as for uh, you know, an image x-ray, um, then maybe a doctor is a better um, 
predictor than our model, and we can try to loop clinicians in the loop if the, our automatic model is answered. And then, of course, the elephant in the room is privacy. Um, for, with my computer science systems hat, um, one of the solutions to data privacy is the fact that perhaps we can try to uh, put more analysis close to where the data is, so closer to the user. And so models can run on device and we can try to make them efficient so that they can run on device. Of course, uh, to build models, um, it's actually good to have quite a bit of data. So I usually divide this into clinical trials uh, that has side effects and the side effect of a clinical trial where we collect important data that is useful to build the models is um, privacy breach. So um, people would give their data and uh, in the in the clinical trials, they, they, have, they have privacy kind of breach because the model needs to be built. But then in large scale, once these models are built, we can spread them out and um, do so in a way that doesn't allow, that doesn't need centralized collection of everyone's data. And we can make the model uh, personalized and stay closer to the user. And this all will be uh, very useful. So in, uh, in, in this talk today, I'll, I'll talk about three examples. Before that, for those who uh, are not familiar with, um, with wearables, I, I'll, I'll discuss a little bit where um, these devices are going. Um, any phone that you carry, a smartphone, can also be considered wearable because you're carrying it. And they have a variety of sensors, inertial measurement units, which measure how much you're moving, um, global positioning system, so uh, a way to measure your location, cameras um, back and front, um, proximity sensors, microphones, and various radio for communications, but also um, can allow to measure proximity to other things or to other devices. Um, the phones also have interesting processors, which could be used, in fact, to run uh, these, these models that I was talking about uh, before. Um, there are also watches uh, that start being able to measure things uh, with other sensors, so uh, PPG set light sensors uh, can measure heart rate. Uh, they start to have sleep monitors that work either through PPG sensors or even microphones. Um, activity monitors, in fact, using the same technology as it is on phones. Um, some of them was also uh, blood oxygen um, sensors um, and electrocardiograms, one lead ECG sometimes are uh, present. And more to come, people are trying to do all sorts, um, such as blood pressure monitor. But there are other devices coming out. And for example, we've been working on um, the next generation um, of earables. Uh, earables have been defined by some of my colleagues as uh, really the next generation smartphones in, in, in terms of uh, groundbreaking technology uh, that, that can happen. And um, the, some people have started looking at how you could possibly put even blood pressure monitoring into this sort of device. So the three examples I'm going to concentrate on uh, in this talk are uh, about the use of uh, accelerometers and IMUs and cardiovascular health, uh, microphone and respiratory health, and location and Alzheimer's disease. Um, so cardiovascular fitness is um, an example of um, something that has been um, difficult to monitor through, uh, <laughs> let's say, cheap devices. If, if I was in the audience, I would ask to raise your hand if you had one of these uh, tests where they put you on a, either a treadmill or a bike, and they ask you to go to the limit of uh, what you can do. Um, this, is, this is a very good proxy to know your fitness. And fitness is uh, an important factor that um, can tell uh, a lot about cardiovascular health. Um, and cardiovascular health is very important. So um, this test is very strenuous, is not very scalable. So uh, people have been through the year trying to find proxies to it. And uh, you, you probably know where I'm going with it, but uh, wearable data could be considered a good proxy. At the moment, proxies for uh, cardiovascular fitness have been um, questionnaires uh, where people are asked how often they, um, they exercise to get over information, anthropometric, uh, anthropometrics information, such as uh, data about your um, 
you know, um, age, uh, BMI, um, and, and, and that would allow people to um, estimate your fitness from that data. Uh, the exercise questionnaires, of course, are cumbersome to keep. You might not remember, you, must, um, you might mis misremember what, what happened or uh, the exact length, or um, you wouldn't have information about your, your heart uh, at that point. So uh, wearable data could be really useful. At the moment, the existing technology um, is starting to uh, give an indication of um, how much your fitness uh, can be represented through your uh, movement. And in fact, my watch gives me an indication of the so-called VO2 max, which is what um, this test uh, measures, which is the volume of oxygen that um, you breathe in and that is transformed into energy by your body when, uh, when you uh, move. And um, so the tests that uh, the, the, the wearables that exist only do this when um, the users are uh, perhaps inputting that they're doing exercise. So this is really not free living. And for people that don't exercise uh, that much, perhaps they walk a lot, but they wouldn't, they wouldn't do this. And therefore we wouldn't have an indication of the fitness. So it's important to find different ways of calculating these measures, uh, which are more like free living. And so uh, this is a paper that we just pushed out um, on archive um, and it's submitted that measures cardiovascular fitness uh, through cardiorespiratory fitness through um, wearable data in free living. Um, our colleagues in um, uh, epidemiology have collected a very precious data set of 11,000 people. And then a subset of these people uh, have also given data seven years later. Um, of the, the the important thing is that these people have had a VO2 max test, a fitness test. So we have the ground truth and we have anthropometrics measures and questionnaires, as well as six days of movement and heart data. The movement data is through a, a wearable device, an IMU, um, through the wrist. And the heart data is uh, through an ECG on, on the chest that measures uh, the heart. Um, the the from this data, we calculate, um, this is a lot of data for the users. And so we condense this in a number of features. Um, and then these features are fed uh, through two uh, fully connected layers of the neural networks. And we try to um, then uh, make some predictions. Can we predict the fitness? Can we um, look if, for example, our model is robust to change? So to if we build a model on the first cohort, would the model then uh, be useful on the following on cohort? And uh, we, we want to see if we uh, are adapting to change. So uh, if you're interested in this work, I will uh, suggest you go and um, read this paper. I will only uh, talk about some of the results at a very high level. Let's start with a picture at the bottom here. So um, the um, this is a VO2 max um, on the x-axis and uh, the two distributions are the blue distribution and the pink distribution. The pink is the predicted and the true distribution of the ground truth of the VO2 max of the users is the one in blue. As you can see, uh, just visually, we seem to under predict um, some of the values for some of the users. So we, we're doing quite well, the overlap is quite high, but we are um, somehow unable to completely match it, but it's a good start. At the top, you see um, in the column of the root mean square error, um, you see the, the results of uh, the error of our predictions. If we just use uh, metrics such as BMI, age, sex, weight, or uh, resting heart rate. Um, I know the sense the resting heart rate is actually quite easy measure to get um, just when someone is uh, sitting. So um, it, it, it's a simple measure to, to get um, through a sensor. Or if you use just a thrombometric heart rate and, and the resting heart rate, or if you use actually the wearable data, resting heart rate and the thrombometrics. And you can see that the arrow just decreases um, a little bit each time. Uh, now, the conversation I had with epidemiologists is always, do we really need this improvement or are we okay with a, a, a four as, a, as, a, um, as, as an error? Well, um, 
obviously it depends on what you're trying to do, but sometimes even this little bit of improvement is um, a, a, good, a good result. So you really want to get this number down. So it's, it's good to try uh, this way. This is obviously a first initial result and we hope to um, be able to improve in this. So um, just to summarize this part, um, this is obviously about wearable in free living conditions and trying to get um, use this data of movement uh, automatically to understand fitness, which is a difficult um, thing to sense. And fitness is a proxy for cardio um, respiratory health. Now, um, another sensor we've used a lot is a, a microphone. And auscultation, which uses the, the, the idea of the micro of listening to the body, um, is a very, very old, um, old way of um, looking for health and diagnose. Um, however, cardiac auscultation is actually quite hard. And uh, here's a citation, a trainee doctors from various countries could only diagnose the heart pathology correctly in 23% of cases. So it's actually quite a difficult thing to do, despite being very cheap and very scalable. And so uh, looking for how we can automate um, sound-based diagnostic is the obvious thing where perhaps machines can help. Uh, and this is because microphones are quite cheap. They're embedded in most of our devices and they're also um, with us all the time. So remember this, uh, if we go back to the slide of the challenges I had before, um, devices are with us all the time. So we could have continuous data from the device and this can give us unprecedented views of our health. Usually you go to doctor once, twice a week or if you're in hospital every day, but it's not really a continuous view. Um, and so it's not just about um, auscultation of the body, it's also about the voice. Um, so the voice is also another biomarker that um, we, we can use to, um, to, to, to diagnose. In this uh, paper from five years ago, um, they use it for signal post-traumatic stress disorder or even heart disease. So this is a tech review of uh, works that have been done in this area. And this has, of course, uh, evolved even further. And of course, I mentioned heart pathologies. Um, you know, there are some heart pathologies that, yes, it can be detected through ECG, but um, some of the pathologies of the heart can only be detected through listening or uh, through an echocardiogram, something that sees the valves. Um, and, and this is an example down there. There's a paper that you can go and read about how we worked on this. Now, obviously, uh, when we talk about microphones, and um, we we're kind of inclined to think of respiratory health and um, COVID was obviously the big uh, respiratory disease that we had in the last two years. So we um, endeavored into a large scale data collection of, um, of data from cough, breathing and a voice uh, from COVID through the release of an app. And um, if you're interested in the data itself, this is described in the New Rips data set and benchmark track paper. And you can ask for the data if you are interested in uh, having uh, a look at the data. So the app collects, in fact, asks you to breathe, cough, and read a sentence on the screen, and we collect all this data. What, what, what is the holy grail here? Well, um, the idea is that uh, if you have a sustainable um, contactless in your pocket um, COVID test, uh, that would be very useful. And so how well can we do that from that sort of data? Uh, well, we, we, we've written a, a few um, indicative papers on how um, one can go about uh, having realistic performance of a um, COVID test. Obviously, um, there are aspects related to um, how, you know, how many symptoms you have and um, would they be displayed in your response? respiration sounds. Uh, and this obviously, I think, changes uh, the, there's a range of performance uh, levels if you don't have those symptoms. And clearly, you know, a respiratory test only has, has its limits. Um, we, we, we show the limitations of this, we show the advantages of this, and uh, we also show that, you know, we are, we are the biggest probably crowdsourced data of three kinds of data uh, worldwide. And so, um, we have people lying to us, people that um, 
you know, uh, input the wrong test results. So we, we asked for people to tell us if they had a COVID test, a real COVID test, so that we can use it as ground truth. But um, obviously um, there is quite a bit of real life data. So free living again uh, in, this, uh, in this study. And we are continuing this study. Um, to me, the holy grail of all this work is uh, the progression study. The fact that our users um, have contributed more than one sample. So we asked them to come back to the app every two days to contribute samples. And this is the distribution of how users have given us samples. And you can see most users have given us only one sample, but uh, there are a few users that are starting to give us uh, quite hundreds of samples. And, and this is very useful because the idea is that we can then personalize the prediction and um, help understand if the prediction, um, if, if, you, if COVID, if you're getting better, if you're getting worse, um, and if you, uh, how, how your disease is going. And this could inform uh, national health services. It could reassure you. It could uh, indicate if you're really uh, improving, perhaps with a, if, if you're taking medications, is you really helping. And, and um, I think this is an invaluable um, thing to, um, to do. Um, I have, um, we have a recent paper on this longitudinal study published, which I'm, I'm not citing here. If you go on the COVID page or if you go on my webpage, uh, you will find our uh, progress on, on this area. And I think it's really where this technology um, should be going uh, on, on this. The third um, aspect I would like to talk about is um, um, related to navigation. So the third sensor is uh, the location sensor. So um, Alzheimer's is a disease that uh, is neurological and often um, the first um, thing that goes in your cognition is your spatial cognition. This has been um, shown uh, by neuroscientists. And so this study uh, was to show if we can see in free living differences between navigation of Alzheimer patients as well as uh, healthy controls. And uh, you find um, the, the reference here at the bottom and you can find it on my webpage. So the data that has been collected by colleagues is uh, through a location tracker, a GPS tracker that um, is displayed here, people were carrying. Um, it's a small study. So we have 18 controls, 18 healthy users and 15 patients. Um, the age is similar, um, also education, male, female, similar. What is different is this, uh, this uh, Alzheimer cognition scoring, other group cognition um, scoring test, uh, for which the control scored much better than the patients. And, and there are, you can, it can be broken down, uh, but, but this is roughly the aggregate value of the control and the patients. And so what we have done is look at trajectories of um, patients as well as control. Um, some patients were uh, a company because they were uh, really quite in uh, advanced Alzheimer's stage. So we've only, in, in some, some of the parts of the study, you can look at the details in the paper, we have looked at only um, patients that were going out without um, being accompanied just to see if they, you know, the, the segments of the trajectories were the trajectories. So we looked at how they move through and carrying this GPS um, device. And we have considered segments as, um, let's say, trajectories that started and came back to the same location, 10 meters or so. Um, and then they took uh, between one and 20 minutes and they were longer than 100 meters. And here is a list of spatial features that have been used to analyze the trajectory. The segment similarity, how similar were all the trajectories of a user. The entropy, so the distribution of the various places. If you split the location into um, a grid, into cells, how many would trajectories visit? So how varied is your coverage of the space? The distance from home, how far are you going from home? Um, how, how many stops and how long are you staying in a particular place? And the turning angle, the fact that perhaps the trajectories were a bit um, complex, um, you know, you were really turning around a lot um, and the segment complexity, um, the number of times a person turned more than 120 degrees in a segment. 
And we looked if any of these uh, features were significant in uh, understanding if we could distinguish with an automatic method, um, automatically um, control end patients. And here is um, a sort of example of, um, not an example, a, a table of how the features scored. So feature one to three are listed at the bottom and the segment similarity, duration of stops and entropy. And um, we show the sensitivity and specificity um, and the prediction uncertainty of, um, of this classifier that tries to classify if someone is um, control or an Alzheimer patient. And as you can see here, it turns out that using these features, the one, two, three features together gives a better combination of sensitivity and specificity and a lower um, variance of them. But you can see how, um, if you go into a paper and want the details, you can see uh, the details of each feature and how well they score. And this is the last uh, classification of the control and patients and shows that, um, you know, if you consider the probability uh, at 50%, of um, if it's about 50%, uh, we consider a person um, healthy. And if it's lower than 50%, um, the, the, the person is scored as a patient. And you can see the real patients are in pink at the bottom and they are all um, quite all apart from two scored at, the, at, the, at zero, meaning um, that their, the scoring of the trajectories is here. Um, there are two exceptions, which are these two, and we looked at their, um, in their ACA um, score, the test, the cognition test score, and they were, in fact, the ones that had the, the highest, the better cognition score. So there's something to be said about perhaps their stage in their, uh, in their disease. I, still, I also know that this is a very initial um, test, and we only have a few patients, as you can see, so it's actually quite difficult to um, to draw bigger conclusions from this, but this is an initial way in which we, we found that some of the features of a movement could be used to understand um, a neurological um, disease. The future is, of course, uh, to have a larger study where we can um, collect more traces and we, we, we build an app uh, for this uh, that um, we will deploy to a clinical trial uh, very soon. I finally, I would like to thank um, my group uh, and you can find all the publications on my webpage and on the group's webpage. And I hope um, this was um, clear and I will um, like to invite you to send me um, emails if you have questions. Thank you very much. Hi there, my name is Marcel Salaté. I'm a professor at EPFL, the Swiss Federal Institute of Technology. And today I want to talk to you a little bit about um, the latest developments in digital epidemiology. And I'm going to share my slides here. Uh, let's see, that should work. Here we go. I'm going to just close my video here and then we should be all set. So what you're seeing here is an early prototype, actually, of a digital contact tracing app. And I'll speak a little bit about that, but about other things as well. Now, the driving force, I think everybody knows, of digitization, um, but worth repeating, is that everything is getting more powerful, smaller, and more connected. And on top of that, we have much more data available. That's, of course, a consequence of the first three points. And we have better algorithms to deal with that data, and that's usually um, talked about under the headline of data science and AI. And all of these processing processes are actually continuing. Um, everything is getting faster, smaller, and more connected. And thus, everything will continue to accelerate. But interestingly, perhaps surprisingly, many organizations still act as if this was not true. And that uh, leads us to all kinds of interesting developments. Now, in epidemiology, um, and this is as a, a specific viewpoint on public health surveillance, but I think it's much broader than that. Um, the traditional approach is this one where you know, someone with a health issue goes uh, and sees a health expert, and then that health expert eventually you know, informs, if it's necessary, any health authorities, and data then is collected and summarized, and eventually it's perhaps shared with academia. And along that pathway, right, you have this massive, massive um, bottleneck of data uh, here sort of indicated in the red dot 
where the patient originally right is full of data um, only can transmit so much data in the classical way to his or her uh, health you know expert physician nurse what have you and then you know there's a little dot here between the physician and the cdc or you know the health authority of your country so massive uh, bottleneck in reality of course since quite a long time actually now we're living in this world right where we're all connected electronic to, electronically with one another uh, through devices through sensors where we're collecting data you know, from as simple as text to relatively complicated data, such as biomarkers. And um, all of this data can now be collected mobily, can be collected on the, on the person directly. Um, so I'm giving you here a list of some of the data um, that you could definitely have access to if you had access to my device or, you know, the various cloud services. And I can then choose to share this information selectively through APIs with third parties. And that leads to a whole new ecosystem of health applications um, where, you know, potentially millions of people share data um, at the same place in a standardized way where with machine learning, then quite incredible uh, insights can be gained. And this is of course a, a dramatically different viewpoint than, you know, one patient just going to their one doctor. And this has been well described uh, in many books. And uh, one of them is, of course, the patient will see you now, which is always a good reference point. Now, from the pure epidemiological perspective, if you focus a little bit on infectious diseases, um, I can show you a couple of examples, but I don't want to spend too much time on them. I just want to say that each of these examples is one particular use case um, for digital epidemiology. Digital epidemiology, like any digital, um, you know, approach, of course, says, well, we can do things perhaps a little bit cheaper, perhaps dramatically cheaper, so more affordable. We can certainly almost always do it faster. Um, and we can do things that weren't, be, weren't able to be done before. So either affordable, fast, or new. And um, I think there's good examples in each of these classes. Just very few examples. Here's a study from colleagues published in PNAS in 2016. This is a um, cholera outbreak in Senegal, which uh, was hard to understand. You know, look at these curves here, right? Um, this, you know, you, you can't torture a, an epidemiological model uh, to give you this kind of dynamic. Yet, uh, when uh, you actually add human movement to it, and in this case, the movement was um inferred from mobile phone data then they actually start to make sense so that's a, a good example of a surveying system that would just be practically impossible and certainly extremely expensive to do in the classical way then here we have an example um, of something that's faster so that's now casting ili influenza like illnesses uh, you perhaps are aware of google flu trends from back in the day the observation that patients first Google symptoms before they go see a physician. And so the search engine can mine this data and build models to understand where uh, are people having the symptoms now? So where is the flu now? And then colleagues here in Boston um, took the approach that, you know, with the problem that of course this search query data is uh, not public data, they used actually Wikipedia access logs, which is public data and which is a good proxy for search behavior and found out that this data also can be used for this kind of now casting. And again, right now castings are doing things a little faster and that can matter as we've seen with COVID, right? Being just a few days faster uh, can really be a make or break issue. Last but not least, the study here uh, where I was involved in is quite old here. You can see this is now 11 years ago. We were looking at sentiments um, of vaccine uh, discussions on Twitter. And this was a very much a niche activity at the time, and now it's completely common sense, and it's done on a very large scale. Um, we showed then, uh, this was during the H1N1 pandemic, that we could mine this data, of course, much smaller. You can see here a couple thousand tweets uh, per day. 
um, that's all there was right at the time. Now, of course, you would have to add three zeros. We're, we're getting millions of tweets each day just talking about vaccination. But we could already show then that, uh, you know, to the extent that we could measure sentiments in each U.S. state, um, this would later correlate with the vaccination coverage. And I'm saying later because only the data was only published later. Things have moved on quite a bit. Now we're getting almost real-time vaccine coverage data with COVID. But back in the day, this was uh, quite delayed. And uh, we were then looking at the correlation here, and we could see already then that uh, where these sentiments were higher as expressed on Twitter, the vaccination rate ended up being higher in those states as well. And that was sort of a first example to tell us that there's probably something there in this data uh, to be useful for public health. Now, just switching gears a little bit here. So then COVID-19 comes along and um, there's of course lots of things one can do with digital epidemiology. My thinking at the time was that perhaps one of the most impactful things that one could do is support contact tracing. And um, contact tracing is usually done um, on symptomatic people um, where you then isolate them and you ask their contacts um, and uh, they have to isolate as well. But in, in, uh, in COVID-19, the problem, of course, was that there was quite a substantial part of pre-symptomatic transmission. And so just cutting the links um, to people who are uh symptomatic is not good enough and i i'm showing you here this with a sort of toy model of a contact network where you have a person here in the middle that's infected and contagious but doesn't know anything about it yet because you know no symptoms and then over time that person infects uh, the neighbors here in the contact network and becomes symptomatic the classical approach would now to be simply put this person in isolation and cut the, the potential transmissions. But as you can see here, it's too late for that. Um, in fact, people also need to be uh, put in quarantine if you really want to cut all the uh, transmission paths. So you also have to find the contacts of that person who are not yet symptomatic. And that's, of course, a challenge. But this is very important because as I keep saying, the alternative to this is to draw a little house here along every person, a little gray house, which is in a uh, you know, quarantine. And then you have your lockdown and um, that's uh, a very low precision way of dealing with the problem. And this here is a very high precision way of dealing with the problem because you isolate only those people uh, where it's actually necessary. Also a reminder that contact tracing is not a new invention and it's not you know, something um, that's sort of a little bit useful. In fact, uh, when it came to SARS-1, contact tracing indeed was the main reason why it didn't develop into a full-blown pandemic. And that's perhaps worth reminding ourselves. So when we develop digital contact tracing, here's uh, sort of the thought model behind it, right? You have Alice going along her uh, normal day she eventually becomes infected. It doesn't matter for the example here how and when that happens. But she then eventually becomes contagious a couple of days later. And then again, a couple of days later, she becomes symptomatic. And that's, of course, when she goes into isolation. Now, classical contact tracing here, CT, uh, kicks in. And ideally, she also has this proximity tracing app. So both go back in time and try to figure out who was she in contact with in that period uh, of contagion. And some people get contacted by manual contact tracing, some by only uh, proximity tracing through the app, some by both, uh, and some not at all. And we assume that those who get contacted, you know, that they play along and indeed go into uh, precautionary isolation, in other words, quarantine. And then indeed, right, most of the cases um, have been dead ends now because they have been in this quarantine. And that brings down uh, the, the burden, right, of this uh, pandemic quite a bit. Now, early on, the group of Christoph Fraser in Oxford um, published this paper um, sort of indicating that uh, if this thing is fast enough, it could really have a major impact. Indeed, it could actually uh, be contained 
without resorting to mass quarantines, right? And AKA lockdowns. Uh, important to remind ourselves that at the time, uh, there were no apps around. There was no broad OS support. There were some uh, initial versions of contact tracing apps, but they had no OS support, certainly not on uh, on iPhones. And so there was also no data to support that notion. So when we developed the model, um, it was quite simple, right? The idea was that phones would essentially make a logbook of, of contacts that were nearby. And, you know, there's a lot of crypto going on, but um, it's not the point of this talk. The point here is just to say that uh, the phones make records of each uh, of each other when they have been in proximity uh, for long enough, you know, according to local public health guidelines. Now, the big uh, discussion, and yeah, by the way, right, all kinds of privacy um, preserving functions are built in here um, on the phone. But the big discussion at the time, you know, around March, April, 2020, was what to do if a person now actually gets indeed you know a positive test for COVID. The uh, there were two models that um, were essentially proposed. I mean there were many, but they all by and large fell into groups or most of them. And one was to say, well, it's it's quite clear, right? I mean if if A had contact with B, C, and D, well the phone should transmit this fact. Right, that A had been in contact with B, C, and D to a central authority. And um, then the central authority could inform B, C, and D uh, and notify them and uh, ask them to take the necessary uh, precautions and go into quarantine. Now, this is all good and efficient, but if you think about it, the central authority here is starting to collect a whole lot of data uh, about contact networks that can then also be used for many, many other purposes, which is almost guaranteed because any digital product eventually has some feature creep. And uh, we wanted to avoid that. Also users lose control over the data, right? I mean, at the point where you transmit all of this rich uh, information about your social contact network, um, if you later decide, well, that's not a good idea, well, too bad, right? You already shared the information and the cat's out of the bag. So we asked ourselves, is there a way to do this um, with the same goal, but in a different way? And that was a decentral model that we proposed, which is that rather than sending along the fact that A had been in contact with B, C, and D, well, we just send along the information that A had been tested positively. That's not very sensitive information um, because you know the person has already been um, tested somewhere in the system and uh, yeah, not very sensitive. Now it's not very efficient um, to do this because now, in fact, you have to inform all the phones participating in your system that A has been infected. But then what happens, right, is that all the phones look up um, their own local contact lists and check if they had actually been in contact with A. And of course, B, C, and D their phones will realize that yes, they have been in contact with A and so their notifications will go off and only their notifications. And so you can see this is the exact same outcome, B, C and D get notified, but now all the contact data stays on the device and the decision about who gets notified is just made locally, right? Completely decentralized on all the phones. So the central server here knows nothing other than which IDs were infected. And again, that's probably something that uh, the central authorities would already know. So this is a highly privacy preserving model. And that was published under the banner of decentralized privacy preserving proximity tracing, which is a mouthful. And so it was um, abbreviated as DP3T. This was then the protocol that was uh, adopted by Google and Apple into exposure notifications. Now, the, this is great from a privacy preserving perspective. The challenge here, of course, is that this is a total black box, right? In the truest sense of the word. I mean, it's privacy by design. So you can't just gather all the data centrally and then figure out whether this thing is actually efficacious. So you need to collect data somehow differently. And we have worked uh, on this quite some time and I won't go into the details, but I just wanna show here that 
we did look at the effectiveness of this um, in, in the summer uh, later in 2020. And we could see that it is effective, but we had very little data because the summer 2020, thankfully, was a very low incidence period. And then when the second wave hit Switzerland, uh, the system stopped collecting the necessary data. So not, not the digital contact tracing system. That worked, that continued to work. But again, in order to understand uh, whether such a highly privacy preserving system is actually efficacious, you need to collect some other data around it. For example, when people come to the test, uh, you need to ask them if they have been alerted by uh, the application. And uh, those questions were simply not asked anymore because the system was under so much burden. The group again of Christoph Fraser uh, was later uh, able to show, to provide much better data. This worked much better in the UK. And um, they published this nature paper um, in 2021. And I just wanna highlight here a few points from the abstract, which is that you know per case, uh, the app notified 4.2 uh, contacts. And that's about three times as much as manual contact tracing would do. Now you can say, well, okay, I mean, the app just um, alerts a whole bunch of people, but is it is it actually you know precise enough or is it just somewhat randomly contacting people? And it turns out the precision, so the secondary attack rate, right? The number of people that are actually infected um, of those that you uh, notify uh, was 6%. And this was similar to the secondary attack rate for uh, manual contact tracing. So same precision, but 3x yield. And what they show is that about 600,000 cases were averted. And this right was in the second wave. So there was no vaccine yet. It's quite possible, even likely, that many of those people got infected in later waves but um, probably with much lower um, health consequences because at the time the vaccination, the vaccines were available. And so they also estimated that for every percentage point increase in app uptake, the number of cases could be reduced by 0.8 to 2.3%. So let's take an average on the here lower end, let's just say about 1%. And just let that sink in, right? That. Um, that you know, one percent of the increase in app usage led to one percent reduction in cases, and that's an extraordinary uh, finding in my view, and a testament to the efficacy of these applications. Now, in the last few minutes, I just want to talk a little bit about um, another aspect about digital epidemiology. Of course, as you know, epidemiology is not just about infectious diseases. It's also about uh, non-infectious or non-communicable diseases, which are uh, the major health burdens in most societies today. And unless, of course, there's a pandemic, which thankfully is still rare. And nutrition is a major contributor to those uh, diseases, but still, we know, relatively little about this because we measure it uh, in a very coarse and analog way. And um, you can see this here also in these uh, insightful graphs from our world and data where you can see that the share of disease burden from infectious diseases is going down quite rapidly as countries are uh, getting wealthier and you know public health and hygiene infrastructures become better. And vice versa, of course, and the share of burden from non-communicable diseases uh, increases. And in uh, healthier countries now, um, wealthier countries, excuse me, uh, the share burden from non-communicable diseases is easily above three quarters, sometimes here even at 90%, right, of the burden. So we need to look into this. And um, since we're focused on nutrition, I'm going to show you here an example of a nutrition project that we're running in our lab. And I think the reason why this is interesting to the audience, even if you're not particularly interested in nutrition, is because of the digital approach we're taking. So we could, of course, just set up a regular um, cohort here, but we're not doing that. We're actually setting up something what we call a digital cohort where we're never meeting these people. Uh, we're simply asking them to subscribe if they're interested. And if they're interested, then we ask them to track their food with an app. We sent them a glucose sensor. 
uh, we get their microbiome sequence. They send the send this a stool sample by mail. And we also ask them for their activity data from, from any particular device that they may or may not have. And so that's um, a kind of a, I think a new approach where things, right, data, uh, health data are really measured directly or, or collected or measured directly uh, from the patient. And I shouldn't even say patient because these are generally healthy people. So these are just the participants. Um, so again, right, stool sample for gut microbiota and diet data via this app, this blood sensor. Um, and here, you know, Apple Watch and Fitbit as two examples, but there's of course many other uh, devices and then all the coordination um, and also other uh, demographic data and other data through, through a coordinating website. And um, we've been running this now for a couple of years. This is finishing uh, this year. Uh, we're starting a pilot in Germany. I uh, would be very interested to also do this in other countries uh, with uh, collaborators locally. The fundamental idea is this. Um, you have nutrition as an input. Now your system, and in particular also the microbiota uh, in your gut, translate this uh, input into any particular health outcome. For example, blood glucose response, but could be any health outcome of interest. And what's interesting is that two people um, with the exact same input by their individual setup, in particular also from the microbiota, will have very different health outcomes. And so that observation has been made multiple times already, but it's um, surprisingly, we're still trying to attribute health properties to foods, and in reality, it should be to the person. This is a map of Switzerland where you can see where our participants are. Um, and this is data uh, from this uh, app uh, tracking uh, the diet where you can see we have here very high resolution um, of, of this food. And we have now about 30 million calories tracked, um, which is uh, quite extensive. And then uh, we also again have the data uh, about the microbiota composition here that tells us uh, which bacteria are how common, and we can now do a very sophisticated analyses on this data. But I don't have the time to go deeper into here, but the point here that I wanna make is that this to me is an important um, new development uh, that actually was recently also highlighted in The Economist. They had a particular issue about variables where in the traditional medical cohorts, right, you, you ask patients or participants to go to a particular health site. Uh, and then all measurements are made on site, such as a hospital. And this uh, digital cohort is now a reversal of that where the measurements are directly made, you know, what computer scientists would call on edge, meaning not centrally, but again, completely distributed on the participants themselves. And they often make the measures themselves or it's some sensor that are attached, uh, that is attached to their bodies. And um, this makes a lot of sense because hospitals are really for serious health issues, but increasingly, right, everything else happens outside hospitals that is health related. And so hospitals remain, of course, perfect for disease-based cohorts, but for everything that happens outside the hospitals, and of course, also everything involving prevention, which is becoming increasingly important, there is no need for physical interaction. There can, of course, be physical action, interaction, but this then makes the project much less scalable. And of course, this requires a new kind of expertise, which is mostly technological. Just a few more words about this app, because this uses a particular um, AI approach, which is quite unusual and you've perhaps never heard of. And so I just want to spend the last two minutes on that. The food tracking app, right? So this is a system that essentially, you know, without going into the details, it's an app and by and large, we're asking people to simply take a picture of what they're eating. And then we're trying to uh, develop uh, artificial intelligence so machine learning models that can make sense of this information. And um, this is a very, you know, ruthlessly optimized app uh, in the sense that it really shouldn't be any work, right? We don't want to type, uh, have the people type in information because as soon as you start uh, participants do that, right? The adherence will drop 
dramatically. And we have very high adherence with this app. Um, and what I wanna show you in particular is that the algorithmic improvement is built in because people can decide to share their images anonymously. And we then take these images, and these are used, right, for the training of the AI algorithm. We take them, and as a reminder, they don't look like this, because that's what a lot of people think food looks like. But food looks more like this, right, at least in Switzerland. Um, wherever you live, it will look different, but you know it doesn't look like this, right? These are stock, stock photos. This is real food. And so um, you need to have a kind of an, a, a method to deal with that. And that's incredibly hard. So what we're doing is we're taking this data, this raw data that's coming in, right, non-annotated. We're pushing it through our version of the AI algorithm. The AI algorithm makes an assessment and then a human annotator verifies this or corrects it if it's wrong. And then we have annotated data. And the human verification step is of course the bottleneck. We could stop here with the annotated data but we don't and um, we put this on a public benchmark and we crowdsource the solution uh, development. And then if anyone submits a better algorithm than what we have, well, we deploy that. And now the, the bottleneck is increased. So we use um, the AI crowd platform for that. Just very simply the way this works is right. The developers now download this data um, and then they try to build a the best model that they can. They upload this model to the platform. We take it in the background. We test it objectively, right? We run the model on private image data from the same data set, but private. And then we can really specify the accuracy and it automatically appears here on a leaderboard. And then, you know, when there's a better algorithm, well, we can just replace what we have with that algorithm and we're a little better. And this really works. And we've just published a paper on this and we, um, you know, it's, it's one thing to say, well, we increase precision and recall, but at the end of the day, we have to have a faster system. And here on the right, you can see um, we experimentally tested this when we updated the latest algorithm in the latest round. Uh, on average, we saved about 20% uh, time depending on the complexity of the dish. So that's crowdsourcing of AI development, which I think is also an important future in digital epidemiology. And with that, I thank you very much. If you have any questions or comments or are interested in a collaboration, please contact me. Uh, we're based in Geneva, in Switzerland. Uh, my name is Marcel Salate. I'm a professor of digital epidemiology, and I thank you very much for your attention. Yeah, thank you, Bernadette, for the very nice introduction. And I hope you can see my slides. Uh, if you could just confirm this, um, that would be nice. Um, okay, so... Um, so yeah, uh, th uh, thank you to the uh, previous two presenters, Cecilia and Marcel. I think they did a great job introducing us into the um, brave new world of applications in mobile health. And I think it's pretty impressive what you can already achieve in this area. Now, the remaining two talks of this uh, first session of this meeting will be taking us into uh, yet another dimension, which is introducing and including the molecular and genomic components into a digital health application. And so what I'm going to talk about is about big data meets genomics from data to clinically actionable knowledge. Now, as an introduction, there are actually basically two ingredients to what we are doing. So the first one is access to big data at scale. And so this kind of data can be, for example, multi-omics data, and I will give you some, expl uh, um, some um, explanations and examples of this. Uh, it can be, sorry, um, it can be, for example, metabolomics data, which has been already partially alluded to by the two previous um, speakers. Uh, and most of what we are doing is uh, certainly that we would be interested in time course data. So we are, uh, um, uh, rather interested in longitudinal cohort data. And last but not least, of course, we would also like to combine um, genomics uh, data, which is mostly coming from, uh, uh, from uh, research uh, in uh, molecular, uh, molecular research uh, with uh, data coming from primary and secondary health data space. Now, the second, uh, so, so the kind of data 
Um, uh, my research, uh, which I go, I'm going to highlight in my presentation, is based on mostly international large-scale large -scale health data and genomics initiatives. And I will uh, walk you through, uh, for example, our activities within the International Cancer Genome Consortium, but also the more recent, recently established Human Cell Atlas Consortium. And I will show you how we can um, uh, capitalize on this kind of data also in clinical translation to bring, uh, bring this to the benefit of our patients. And the second ingredient uh, beyond big, the, the access to big data is, uh, and that's the, what the conference is about, is, uh, is uh, artificial intelligence based uh, approaches. Now, just to remind us uh, that although artificial intelligence has uh, received a lot of attention in the uh, over, only over the last few years, I just would like to remind all of us that the concept of artificial intelligence is not at all uh, new. It has been invented already in the mid uh, of last uh, century, so in the 1950s, and uh, where artificial intelligence has been uh, uh, introduced to imitate intelligent behaviors in computers. Now, there has been uh, different waves of innovation in this area. And uh, one of the first one was uh, by the uh, upcoming developments in machine learning, where artificial intelligence uh, was brought further by learning and predicting from uh, training data. And recently, with the advent of, uh, of access to uh, data at scale, but also computational resources at scale for wider community, uh, deep learning uh, is actually into bringing uh, the machine learning approaches to yet another scale with higher precision and uh, predictivity. And so, of course, we have seen many examples also in this uh, session, how deep learning can actually outperform our other learning algorithms in terms of our increasing amount of data and performance of the predictivity of their models. Now, uh, already 15 years ago, the International Cancer Genome Consortium was found, uh, founded as a large scale genomics initiative with the goal to obtain a comprehensive description of genomic, transcriptomic, and epigenomic changes in 50 different tumor types or su uh, subtypes of tumors, which are of high clinical and societal importance across the globe. Now, over the last uh, 10 to 15 years, we have seen 86 different projects committed uh, uh, on a national scale, um, so, uh, each of them having a focus on a certain cancer type or cancer subtype. Now, I had the privilege uh, not only to co-lead uh, one of the germ networks on pediatric brain tumors together with Peter Lichter, but also I was uh, uh, providing the computation resources uh, for uh, two other German-centered uh, projects within the ICGC consortium, one of them focusing on malignant lymphoma and prostate cancer as the second one. Now, you, uh, when you're looking at scale in the genomic landscape of those tumor types, you're always doomed, sir, almost doomed to find uh, uh, exciting new uh, uh, behaviors and new structures in those tumors. And so uh, while in the very beginning, almost uh, more than 10 years ago, um, we were kind of more, more or less describing the genomic landscape, alteration landscape of, for, for example, early childhood brain tumors. Uh, later on, we went, took it further on to better understand disease pathomechanisms on, a, uh, on many different levels, including, for example, the epigenetic scale, uh, which uh, also brings in uh, primarily the environmental exposure component into the cancer field. Now, of course, uh, the, uh, having seen a, a massive amount of uh, patients uh, uh, having been sequenced across many different tumor types, um, the, the direct next step was to leverage upon this collection, huge collection of uh, the variety of data collector across different cancer entities to, uh, to better understand the similarities, but also the differences between, uh, uh, between different cancer types on the uh, multi-omic scale. And so this, this was the birth uh, date of uh, the so-called uh, ICGC Peacock project, which is the pan-cancer extension of the International Cancer Genome Consortium. 
Now, interestingly, uh, Lincoln Stein, who has been one of the, uh, the promoters and founders of this initiative, uh, described this, uh, uh, this initiative as the largest uh, biomedical experiment arguably uh, ever being launched without having lifted a single pipette. Now, in this international huge and large scale initiative, more than 1,300 scientists from over 37 countries um, uh, participated, and, uh, uh, and we did this by looking into 2,600 genomes being collected across eight, uh, 38 different tumor types and being provided to the wider international community through five data portals. One of them I had the privilege to co-host with my colleagues. Now, they have, this data has been massively and intensively and thoroughly analyzed in different working group and, 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 and each of them actually uh, produced new insights uh, into uh, the genomic landscape, uh, both within tumors, but also across tumors. And just to give you two examples, uh, one which is uh, had, uh, was co uh, headed by Peter van Loo, um, and so, uh, uh, here we were looking in, uh, in a larger working group into the genetic intertumor heterogeneity across more than 2,600 human cancer genomes, and we characterized them thoroughly. Now, another study, which was uh, co-led by Peter Lichter, Vincent Ferretti, and myself, we were characterizing the landscape of viral association in human cancers. We, we could attribute a so-called viral uh, fingerprint to each and every single uh, tumor type and tumor subtype. Now, having all this data at scale across different cancer entities at hand, the, uh, the next question was, how can we bring this into clinical practice to the benefit of our cancer patient? And already in 2013, Peter Lichter, Christoph von Kalle and myself back in Heidelberg uh, to, uh, and were, it started a very ambitious program where we tried to uh, bring a genome sequencing at scale to our cancer, uh, to our, our cancer patients being treated at the um, Comprehensive Cancer Center in Heidelberg. Now, the Comprehensive Cancer Center, the National Center for Tumor Diseases in Heidelberg, was the first joint venture, uh, was uh, created by a joint venture of the German Cancer Research Center at the University Hospital in Heidelberg. And within this National Center for Tumor Disease, we see around about 10,000 cancer patients annually. And our rough estimate when we started this program almost exactly 10 years ago was that for a third of them, cancer genome sequence might be an additional option for enhanced diagnostic and treatment recommendation. Now, the Heidelberg experience uh, um, originating and from the National Center of Tumor Diseases uh, uh, became a national role model. And so far we have heard, uh, brought this, wrote this out in 65 different projects looking at uh, 2,700 samples, uh, including single cell sequencing, liquid biopsies, organoids, and so forth, and being rolled out as the uh, national, nationwide NCT Master Precision Oncology Program. Now, in the first by, uh, stage, um, we selected and for, for eligibility uh, for this program, only uh, relatively young patients with advanced stage uh, cancer, where according to the, tre uh, the guidelines, uh, there were no further treatment options um, uh, available so that patients, uh, those patients were diagnosed with an incurable common malignancy at an unusually early age. Now, we can say that after a few years experience in this program that we not only learned a lot, but I think that we can actually claim that we uh, that our cancer patient benefited a lot from um, cancer genome sequencing in clinical practice. So after five years into the program, our treatment recommendation, which is solely based on data-based genome sequencing, uh, uh, diagnostics and uh, therapy recommendation, we can we are able uh, to offer and um, a treatment recommendation for four out of five patients, so for 80% of, of all of, of our uh, patients. And uh, in about 35%, uh, so a third of all cases, our genomics guided treatment recommendation is being taken up by the oncologist. 
And uh, after one year of treatment, uh, we can actually at least uh, um, 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 state that uh, for almost half uh, of all of uh, those patients, we can uh, uh, we can say uh, uh, observe um, a, a, a disease control rate. So the overall response rate is uh, is uh, pretty imp impressive here, and but also you can learn also uh, feedback information into fundamental research. As for example, we learned that in more than 15% of all cases, we could actually find identify actionable germline alterations, which was far exceeding our uh, primary ex uh, expectations. Now, of course, you have to prove the effectiveness of those uh, um, um, genome gui genomics guided uh, treatment in clinical trials. We're doing this at scale in so-called basket trial. And I just would like to uh, point out that one of those trials, uh, which, is, uh, which is designed for uh, patients with DNA repair deficient cancer, the biomarker, so to speak, uh, uh, which is uh, being used for uh, categorizing and grouping those patients in the different treatment categories in this clinical trial is actually an AI machine learning guided uh, um, statistical model. Now, of course, uh, uh, despite this, uh, um, what we consider a huge advance in genomics guided treatment of our patients, we still uh, uh, we are well aware of the fact that we are looking at uh, at a disease which comes with a heterogeneity at a cellular level, which we kind of ignore if we just do one sample uh, for one uh, particular tumor and we perform bulk sequencing of this sample. And of course, there are uh, more recent technologies being developed over the last five to 10 years, which are de uh, designed towards uh, understanding disease heterogeneity at a uh, cell by cell level at a time by single cell sequencing. And that actually formed the birth date of uh, yet another in, uh, international long-term large-scale initiative, the so-called Human Cell Atlas Initiative, which was uh, formed um, almost five years ago. And the mission of the Human Cell Atlas Initiative is to create a comprehensive reference map of the types and properties of all human cells, which are the fundamental unit of life as a basic for understanding, diagnosing, monitoring, and treating health and disease. Now, again, this is a huge international initiative, uh, which has now, as, uh, as by a state of the, um, by the end of last year, has seen more than 2,000 members across 75 countries um, being uh, doing their research in more than 1,200 institutes. Now, of course, uh, the research is again being formulate, uh, formulated not only regionally, but uh, concentrated uh, across different organs or bio, uh, biological systems like the endocrine system. And, uh, and I just want to point out that, for example, the largest initiative for, uh, in terms of numbers of samples and uh, cell sequence so far in this international initiative is, uh, is uh, the development of human cell atlas. Uh, where 70 individuals have been uh, sequenced uh, uh, from more than 700 uh, samples, uh, resulting in more than four, uh, 4 million cells. Um, uh, you probably have seen this, uh, uh, this, uh, this uh, uh, highlighted uh, 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 publication in Science uh, from um, a little bit less than two weeks ago, highlighting some of the work of the Human Cell Atlas Initiative, in particular um, in the initiative of the Immune Human Cell Atlas, where um, uh, groups um, around uh, primarily Sarah Teichmann and colleagues uh, were able to map cell identities across tissues and organs on an immune cells uh, level. Now, the contribution of my of my work in, in this human cell atlas initiative is uh, is on yet another or, organ, the pancreas, where we try to understand thoroughly and uh, and carefully the contribution of the pancreas in both the with the exocrine and endocrine system in uh, in different pathomechanisms originating from uh, from the pancreas, including. Uh, type 1 and type 2 diabetes, but also uh, different malignancies. 
Now, of course, um, and, uh, during the pandemic, the Human Cell Atlas also made a tremendous contribution to untangling COVID-19 patho uh, pathophysiology at the single cell level, uh, single cell resolution. And uh, at a time before even the first um, the first uh, COVID-19 um, uh, patients uh, um, were detected and diagnosed in Germany, in February 2020, we were already uh, able to identify from, uh, based on um, lung and bronchial samples from healthy inf uh, individuals, we could identify those cell types which are according to their required um, uh, virus um, um, uh, entry receptors, uh, we were able to identify those uh, cell types which are most um, uh, vulnerable for SARS-CoV-2 infection. Now then when uh, the first patients uh, uh, were diagnosed and hospitalized with COVID-19 at the University Medical Center in Berlin, the Charity, we started a, a, a large-scale prospective COVID-19 cohort, uh, which aimed at uh, including all uh, patients hospitalized with COVID-19 at the Charity. And of course, the first step was that we were taking uh, samples from different areas of the respiratory system, both the upper respiratory uh, system uh, in the nasopharynx, but also from the lower respiratory system, including the bronchi and the lung. And we took those samples for forward for single cell sequencing and single cell, mostly RNA sequencing to understand the pathophysiology of SARS-CoV-2 infection. And in the first attempt, we were interested in under, understanding different severities of uh, severity groups of COVID-19, where we were looking at moderate uh, patients with a moderate course of the, uh, disease and compared them to critical patients, which were uh, we, uh, which mostly uh, required uh, mecha uh, mechanic ventilation uh, during uh, ICU treatment. And of course, we also had healthy controls in the study. And overall, we were looking early on in 2020 at 24 different individuals with 36 samples from the different parts of the respiratory systems uh, coming from a little bit more than, uh, a little bit less than 20 COVID-19 patients and, uh, and according controls. Now, of course, uh, when you do this at scale, you can identify the different cell types uh, in the nasopharynx and the different anatomical location of the respiratory system, including epithelial cells, uh, immune cells from the myeloid system, but also the, of course, the lymphoid cells. And, uh, and if you do this at scale, or it's, uh, you can also make a, a very a basic but uh, highly interesting observation that with increasing uh, severity of disease uh, from left to right, uh, the first column is the controls, the second is the moderate patients, and on the right-hand side, the critical patients, you can see that some of the cell types you, uh, you're actually losing, like basal cells are massively decreased in the population of cells, and the same is true for resident macrophages, whereas other cell types are massively accumulated, as already been known before, neutrophils are, massive, are massively enriched, in particular in, uh, in critical patients, uh, where almost two out of three cell types are being contributed by neutrophils, but also other um, epithelial cells like secondary differentiating cells are being massively accu uh, accumulated with increased uh, severity of disease. And of course, uh, um, it has been well known uh, uh, since the very beginning that the critical pathophysiologies are not primarily caused by the SARS-CoV-2 viral infection, but by a hyperactivation of the immune system. And, uh, and of course, this is mostly due to an enhanced and sustained activation of cell-to-cell uh, -cell interactions. And so I would like to highlight uh, two particularly immune cell types, uh, in particular the cytotoxic T cell lymphocyte, but also non-resident macrophages, which show a massive increase uh, from moderate to critical conditions in terms of uh, interactions with different cell types. And a particularly 
axis of interaction between immune and immune uh, immune and immune cell interaction is uh, through uh, a chemokine receptor chemokine receptor one and so uh, the responding ligands uh, ccl2 and ccl3 being expressed mostly on macrophages but also other immune cell types and where we actually postulated um, that the binding of the CCL2 and 3 uh, ligand to the CCL1, 2, and 5 receptor has been well known to facilitate macrophage recruitment. And our hypothesis was that blocking this axis may alleviate immune hyperactivation in severe uh, COVID-19 cases. Now, interesting and luckily, um, there is an antagonist, a small molecule available, which has been developed by a Bayer pharmaceutical companies already almost 15 years ago for the treatment of chronic inflammatory diseases. This uh, small molecule has been uh, uh, probed in clinical phase one and two trials against a variety of chronic inflammatory diseases. And now we we took this uh, small molecule into, uh, into a clinical phase two in, uh, investigator initiated clinical trial where we try to, uh, to uh, pr uh, probe whether this uh, CCR1 antagonist can be used for the prevention of, uh, of progression of COVID-19 uh, cases into severe, um, uh, into severe um, conditions. Now, I think this is a very impressive example where only within 50 months uh, for a disease which has not been known before, uh, a clinical trial, phase two trial, uh, trial uh, could be initiated as a multicentric clinical trial and where hopefully we can contribute with our fundamental research uh, with a rapid translation into clinical uh, practice uh, to prevent uh, severe courses of diseases. Now, this was just one uh, example how we took advantage of our, of our big data in combination with single cell sequencing technologies at scale. And I just would like to point out that we have been looking uh, using this combination of technologies uh, into also um, other conditions of COVID-19, in particular in the context of cardiovascular uh, uh, prior, prior existing diseases, but also we took this uh, forward to understand why children are um, uh, almost equally affected by COVID-19 as adults, but very rarely only process into a severe um, disease condition. Now, with this, I would like to conclude my presentation and summarize uh, what I have shown you. Um, so I, I hope I could convince you that the combination of deep learning and big data advances helps to advance our understanding of path mechanisms in variety of diseases. The dissection of disease pathomechanism at the single cell level allows a rapid clinical translation and the combination of massive genomics together with digital approaches is uh, of course most advanced in cancer, but other disease areas like respiratory disease and cardiovascular diseases are very uh, rapidly ramping up. Now. I would like to conclude my presentation with mentioning that this has been a massive collaboration uh, across many different contributors in, in the field of immunology. For example, the group of uh, Irina Lehmann at the Charity has been instrumental in our COVID-19 research, but also the contribution and collaboration with our clinical partners, both uh, in infectious diseases, but also in cancer, uh, have been instrumental in, uh, in, uh, in understanding disease pathologies and also getting access to patients where we are mostly grateful to our patients for contributing to our research. Now, with this, I would like to conclude my presentation. And if there is time and chance for questions, I'm happy to answer them. Otherwise, I'm very happy to receive your questions by email and comments later on. Thanks, Cell Press, for the invitation. In the following presentation, I will focus mainly on our development and applications of idoscopists in the identification of gene mutants for advancing cancer biology and treatment. In particular, 
I will use KRAS and colorectal cancer as an example to illustrate our idea. The theme of this year's meeting is the future of medicine. Of course, to predict the future is difficult. So perhaps let me begin with a couple research gaps I observed regarding the current status of AI in medicine. Hopefully that will shed light on the future. First, notice that when we learn, we often learn in steps and sometimes the order of these steps matters. In contrast, when we taught an AI system, we often taught him directly to deal with a specific task without requiring him to know much prior knowledge of the subject. Learning paths of AI is therefore something that we should pay attention to in the future. Second, when we design an AI system, we sometimes prefer him to learn from a knowledgeable person, that is an expert. In the medical domain, this could be the clinicians, but different from AI in other domains, clinicians may eventually become the users of AI in medicine. Therefore, if you analyze from their perspectives, it is not difficult to notice that his needs could be something entirely different. Maybe the ability of AI to provide new knowledge and new insights are something that they treasure more. Nevertheless, if AI produces something new, how trustable is the output? There are already criticisms on AI algorithms like deep learning that they act like a black box. Indeed, if a person's act is interpretable, it is easier for the others to trust him. So as AI. To build trust in AI and to collaborate with him, one has to study his behaviors and see if they are justifiable. Other evidence should also be collected to see if his output can fit in the whole picture. The works that I will be discussing aim to contribute new ideas in these above topics. We spin off from the Chinese University of Hong Kong in 2018, initially with an aim to prevent colorectal cancer by artificial intelligence. Colorectal cancer is chosen as the starting point because it remains as one of the most common cancers worldwide. Fortunately, different screening tests for colorectal cancer are available and proven to be effective. Amongst them, colonoscopy is unique because it does not only allow the screening of CRC, but also using therapeutic endoscopy, precancerous or adenomatous tissues can be removed on site and thus preventing CRC to occur or further progress. At present, endoscopists use their bare eyes to detect polyps. Suspicious tissues will be removed and sent to a pathologist who will examine it under the microscope. Feedback will be given to the clinicians who will then inform the patients regarding the appropriate treatment and follow-up plans. Idoscopists, on the other hand, can help to pick up missed pouring during this process, as well as to suggest different treatment strategies on site. We coined the area idoscopist because he acts like an artificial intelligent endoscopist. In practice, instead of directly connecting an endoscope to the screen, the scope will go through idoscopist who will process the video in real time before displaying the results onto the screen. The main panel here shows the view of an endoscope. Suspicious regions will be highlighted by idoscopist and a snapshot will be automatically taken and displayed in the smaller panel for review. If a suspicious polyp has been picked up by endoscopist, the endoscopist can always go back to recheck the region of interest and then decide if any treatment is needed. Endoscopist was built on deep learning and transfer learning. A backbone network was connected to a real-time object detector to analyze the spatial features in each frame. Then a tracker was used to filter the information in the time domain. Highlighted regions were classified into one of the 20 categories of objects. In recent decades, deep networks are growing massively in size. 
every year, the training flops for AI models have increased by four times. The growth rate is even greater for the transformer AI models, whose training flops are jumping by 275 folds every two years. Training these networks are becoming increasingly complex. Idoscopist was trained through multiple rounds. First, we adopted the pre-trained weights from the ImageNet challenge. This challenge encompassed over 1.2 million images from 1,000 classes of general objects. Then it was trained with colon images extracted from endoscopy videos downloaded from both public and private databases. Finally, non-medical images from an online search engine were also used to test idoscopies and then subsequently included into the training process. Together, these contribute around 290,000 images for training idoscopists. Amongst them, over 160,000 images have at least one polyp in them. To test the idoscopist, we collected another 144 endoscopy videos. These videos were new to idoscopist. For each of them, a corresponding endoscopy report was attached to it. Over 3 million images were extracted and they were annotated as much as possible. For tissue samples that have been resected, the findings from the respective pathology reports were also used as the ground truth to label those regions. Labeling of the videos required a huge amount of assets. For each video, we first looked for the use of an instrument, which indicated the presence of polypectomy. Then from the start of the polypectomy, we scrolled back until the first appearance of a polyp. A polyp was highlighted with a rectangular box in each frame during this period. In other video segments, suspicious, suspicious regions were relabeled as much as possible into one of the other non-polyp classes, such as bubble and stool. Except during polypectomy, during which we did not label the images due to the lack of manpower. To understand the behavior of idoscopist, a set of non-medical images were downloaded from an online search engine and used to test idoscopist. Keywords used to search for these images were initially taken from the description of a product. Then the list was extended to include other keywords, which we found may arrive in objects that share common features with a polyp. Interestingly, the percentage of images that was misclassified as a polyp varied by more than eight times. This indicates that for some of these categories of images, they carried characteristics that are closer to those of a polyp. In particular, objects that were more often misclassified as polyps includes those that have vessel patterns, especially broken vessels, different body parts, as well as some types of food. Other patterns and objects, such as water droplets, were also sometimes misclassified, but less frequently. All these images were further recategorized to train idoscopists. The graph here shows the image-based evaluation results. The blue line indicates the performance of idoscopist when he was trained to use both spatial and temporal features and by both medical and non-medical images. Whereas the orange line shows the performance of idoscopist when only spatial features and colon images were used during the training process. The sensitivity of the different training trust strategies can differ by as much as 8% for the same specificity. On the other hand, if idoscopist was evaluated on a polyp basis instead of an image basis, the three training schemes that used colon and non-medical images for training came up with very similar results, as indicated by the blue and the two green lines in this graph. 
polyp-based evaluation required idoscopists to recognize a polyp in at, as at least 16% of the feed, uh, time of the video clip. And at the same time, he cannot mishighlight more than 16% of the time in non lesion video clips. In other words, idoscopists can identify most of the polyps, although he cannot identify them at all angles and in all scenarios. In brief, idoscopists can correctly identify 97% of the polyps. We are also confident that his false positive rate should be well less than 7% because the current evaluation method included missed polyp, hyperplastic polyps that were not resected, as well as polyps that were localized during polypectomy as false positives. Furthermore, we were interested to see whether the polyp detection rate can be improved if idoscopists were to be used in real time. A cohort of 102 patients were recruited. Amongst them, 62 patients were found to have at least one polyp. For the other 40 patients, no polyp was found during the initial endoscopy. We then invited endoscopists to review the suspicious regions highlighted by idoscopists. The endoscopists report an, an additional polyps in five patients, three with high confidence. In other words, compared to the current clinical practice, if an endoscopist was used in real time, he can help to potentially detect one more patient with polyp for every 20 to 33 colonoscopies. In the next step, instead of training another AI model from scratch, we further modified idoscopist to let him learn to recognize histological images of colorectal cancer. This time, idoscopist was modified to accept histological image tiles of different magnification ratios as inputs. Three subtasks were designed and they aim to classify tissue types, to identify a panel of gene mutations, and to classify consensus molecular subtypes. At each stage, a different set of pre-trained weights were used. Data from 461 patients downloaded from the TCGA database were used to train, validate, and test the model. Moreover, Histological images from another 40 patients who have been diagnosed with CRC from the Prince of Wales Hospital were also collected. These were used only for external testing only. An ensemble network with seven subclassifiers were built for the first subtask. The pre-trained weights were adopted from deep features learned to localize colorectal polyps in endoscopy videos. In both the public and private databases, endoscopist was able to correctly identify 97% of the primary tumor size. The specificity was 95%. In the second subtask, multi-instance learning was used to identify a panel of gene mutants. Frequent mutated genes that were found in all cancers were excluded. A panel of 13 genes were finally selected for further training. For each slide, a probability heat map that indicates possible mutations of each gene in each child will be independently generated. Area under the ROC curves was used as the performance metrics for both five and 20 magnification ratios. The performance of idoscopists for predicting mutations in these selected genes generally follow the same trend. The prediction of KRAS mutants as highlighted in green in this graph performed fairly well amongst the 13 selected genes. The ratio of KRAS wild type to KRAS mutant tiles were around six to four. For some other genes, gene mutants occurred only in around 10% of the tiles. 
Because the distribution of gene wild type and mutants were not even for each gene. And in addition to the ROC curves, I shown here also the precision recall curves. PRC plots the positive predicted values versus the sensitivity and does not involve in the calculation of wild type styles that have been correctly predicted. While an ideal ROC curve should move towards the top left hand corner, an ideal PL curve should move towards the top right hand corner. Again, using the area under ROC and PRC as performance metrics, the prediction of KRAS mutants was considered as fair amongst the selected panel of genes. Taking a closer look, we can notice that the optimal operating threshold for different genes were different. For some genes, such as APC and TP53, Idoscopist was able to use a wider range of thresholds to identify at a relatively lower net force negative rate. Most of the time, he was more confident in identifying the wild type of these genes. And these genes happened to be the tumor suppressor genes. On the other hand, there were also certain genes where idoscopists preferred to identify with an extremely low threshold. Most of the time, the rate of falsely identify a gene mutant in these cases is lower than that of the wild type. Typical examples were two oncogenes. As for KRAS, it behaves closer to the group of oncogenes. Here shows the visualization heat maps of seven typical slides. All tiles of the same slide were marked with the same set of labels. In other words, training was carried out by a weekly supervised learning approach. Normally, during sequencing, only a small part of the tissue from a slide was sampled. On the other hand, idoscopist was designed to predict for each child independently. And then an overall result was made for the whole slide. It is therefore possible that the discrepancy between the two methods was caused by the sample location of the sequencing method. In the last subtask, Idoscopus was designed to classify each tile into one of the four consensus molecular subtypes. KRAS mutants was initially thought to relate to CMS 2, 3, and 4. More recently, the list of genes associated with these subtypes was expanded to include a couple other genes, most of which were included in our study. Since the gene list overlaps those included in the second subtask, we used the pre-trained weights from the previous stage in this subtask. Labels were obtained from a random forest classifier, which used 200,000 gene mutations to classify CRC histological images into the four subclasses. The RF classifier and idoscopist agreed in only around half of the slides. They agreed better on CMS2 and 4. The results suggested that the optimization of the prediction of the selected gene mutants did not lead to better CMS classification. In this last section, let me use KRAS as an example to further explain its significance of the findings of idoscopists on colorectal cancer biology and treatment. The output of idoscopists was further compared with the sequencing technique in identifying KRAS mutants in 40 subjects recruited from the Prince of Wales Hospital in Hong Kong. Idoscopists were blinded to the survival data of these patients. Using the whole histological slide from each patient, Idoscopist was asked to predict whether the subject had KRAS wild type or KRAS mutants. Compared to the results obtained from the sequencing method, the performance between the two methods in terms of AUROC sensitivity and specificity 
were found to be similar to those computed from the TCGA database. Interesting enough, when we studied the survival analysis of these patients, we found that within the first six months after diagnosis, the percentage of survival was similar between the two groups of subjects, that is, subjects whom idoscopus has identified with KRAS wild type or KRAS mutants. Nevertheless, the percentage survival of these two groups of patients widened after six months. And by the end of the 30th month, percentage survival of the two groups differed by almost 25%. Patients predicted with KRAS mutants had a higher chance to survive. Similar phenomenon was not observed for the two groups of patients who were divided up by the sequencing method as, in, as indicated by the two black lines in this graph. Is this finding by adoscopists trustable? First, let us review our current understanding of KRAS mutations and its significance in colorectal cancer biology. A recent update published in Cell presented a thorough view on the topic. In brief, the KRAS protein can be viewed as a combination of two regions. The G domain is responsible for catalytic activity and effective binding, while the hypervariable region is responsible for binding to the plasma membrane. The KRAS protein relays signals from outside the cell to the cell nucleus, and it's part of the ras map k pathway. It acts like a switch that can be turned on and off during the signal relaying process. A single amino acid mutation in the KRAS G domain can already stop the GDP GTP binding to this site and thus disrupt the well regulated function of KRAS. Indeed, single base substitutions in codon 12 and 13 are very common carcinogenic mutations that affect the GTP base um, function. These KRAS mutations lead to stabilization of the protein in its, in its prolonged active state, thereby amplifying the downstream MAPK signaling pathways in CRC cells. Although different therapeutics that target and inhibit molecules downstream of KRAS has been proposed for CRC. They were not very successful so far. For example, sotorosib is a small molecule that selectively and irreversibly targets KRAS. When given to patients with colorectal cancer with this mutation, their responses were not as promising as to non-small cell lung cancer patients with the same mutation. This suggests that either KRAS is not the dominant oncogenic driver for colorectal cancer or that other pathways mediate the oncogenic signaling pathways beyond KRAS. Indeed, KRAS is currently thought of a driving core oncogene in colorectal cancer, but usually have to be accompanied by other gene mutations such as APC and TP53. Is it possible that patients with KRAS mutants survive longer than those with KRAS wild type? No simple answer to this question yet. First, the sequencing method normally have to sample at a specific location, and the results were used to infer for the whole piece of tumor tissue. While idoscopists analyzed each tau and decided based on the results from all tau's, although they were both testing for KRAS mutants, there are slight differences that cause discrepancies. Second, some gene proteins and or signaling pathways can have both oncogenic and tumor suppressive functions. Although the oncogenic role of KRAS is better studied, it does not exclude the possibility that other KRAS mutants can have a tumor suppressive function. 
Third, some protein variants were found to be more effective in blocking entry of a virus. For example, in the case of ACE2 variants, some natural ACE2 variants can modulate the susceptibility to SARS-CoV-2. In the progression of CRC, if this involved other microorganisms, our current understanding of KRAS and many other gene mutations may not be revealing the complete picture in colorectal cancer biology. To summarize, in the past, our goal of developing and applying AI were often to replace a tedious and labor intensive task that we human beings would like to avoid. With the advancements in AI, this could change fundamentally. AI could possibly bring us new knowledge and new insight. Using the identification of KRAS as an example, I discussed how different training pathways of AI doscopist can lead to new discovery that may not be intuitive to our current understanding of colorectal cancer biology. The findings may be able to help us to advance disease biology and reform how healthcare should be delivered. Of course, many of those need deeper thoughts and research, as well as innovative ways to verify. Our group has been working in various projects that involve AI in the design of medical devices, therapeutics, prediction algorithms, and healthcare delivery approaches, and many of them for different diseases. We are keen to put to them together in a holistic and integrated picture in order to truly experience how the power of AI can transform our future healthcare model. I would like to thank colleagues who have helped in the above research. The work on gene mutations were mostly completed by Yu Qi and Cecilia. Many colleagues from CU Surgery, Medicine and Pathology have helped to make this work possible. If you are interested, you may find my work using this ID. Thank you very much for your attention.